The last few years have been some of the most volatile in history for U.S. agriculture. We'll take a look at the past year and forecast for the next. If you farm or if you eat, join us as we take a look back and a look ahead next on Show Me Ag. Welcome to Show Me Ag. I'm your host, Kyle Vickers. Uncertainty has always been a part of agriculture, but maybe now more than ever. Global economics are making things extremely volatile, with grain prices and livestock prices collapsing and farm income falling sharply this year. To explain what's going on in the market, we have with us an authority on U.S. agricultural economics, Pat Westhoff of the Food and Agriculture Policy Research Institute, commonly known as FAPRI. He and his associates track worldwide agriculture trends for the U.S. government and private business, and we have some questions about where things are headed. Thanks for joining us again, Pat. Uh, this seems like an annual event. You come to us. We really appreciate you spending your time with us. But that volatility and the prices going up and down, that seems to be a recurring theme. That is indeed the case. We've seen a lot of volatility the last couple of years. This year, a big change in livestock prices, for example. A, a big fall, a big unfortunately. Fall. That's right. Let, let's talk about some big issues, macro issues first. First of all, the U.S. economy. And, and it seems to be better, but there's still some trouble spots. Right. We're still seeing we're, you know, some positive growth in the U.S. economy. Uh, employment's going up every month. Unemployment rates at a reasonable level compared to its history. So lots of positive signs there. But there's definitely concerns as well. Uh, we still have a, a lower share of the population working than we have historically. And now that the Fed started raising interest rates, you know, there's concerns about that might mean as well. It seems like to me they're making an effort to slow the economy down when it really didn't need any breaks. It needed, uh, it still needed acceleration. There's definitely concern about, about you know, whether there be a potential for inflation in the future. So that's one of the reasons they're doing this. And also to give them a little bit of room if they should need to relax in the future against a to, real downturn. To back off just right. a little bit. Right. One of the concerns the last few weeks has been the situation in China. And, and they are such a big part of the world's economy. When they, uh, when they have a cold, we all have to sneeze, I guess. Explain a little bit about what's going on in China and how that will impact us. Sure. The Chinese economy has been growing at a phenomenal rate for the last two decades, you know, averaging more than 7% per year over that period of time. That means every 10 years, you know, the size of the economy doubles. So that's just a phenomenal uh, thing that's occurred. Now we have seen a bit of a slowdown. Uh, a lot of the banks they have there are having trouble. The construction industry has slowed down. And so there's concern that we're looking at a much lower rate of growth in China in front of us. And, and how does that affect us? Uh, I know we, we are borrowing a lot of money from China, for one thing. But uh, tell us a little bit about how that affects us, and specifically U.S. agriculture. It's hugely important for agriculture. Here in Missouri, our number one product is soybeans. Number one market in the world is soybean, for, for soybeans is China. In fact, China buys more soybeans than everybody else in the world put together in the world market. So what they do is tremendously important. China's meat consumption is now larger than the meat consumption in the United States by a long shot. And so what, what ends up happening there ends up driving feed markets around the world. And do we send a lot of livestock and meat products to, uh, or is it mostly ingredients that we're sending? It's mostly ingredients. In fact, mostly soybeans right now. We sell a small amount of corn. We sell you know, a small amount of meat products as well, but it's primarily ingredients right now. One, product, one market that was very important for us recently was dairy products. So we were selling increasing amounts of dairy products to China. That's pulled back a bit now. It's one of the reasons, many of the reasons for the, the pullback in milk prices this past year. Over my lifetime, we've talked about what if those countries like China and India improve their diet by adding protein. That's kind of where we're at. They're uh, adding it through meat products and through soybean products. That's been a big impact on our market, hasn't it? It certainly has been, yes. Uh, meat consumption in China you know, has increased by tremendous amounts over the last couple of decades. They probably have some more room to run. Uh, but their diets are not as different from ours as they once were. And so we can't expect China to be the kind of engine of growth that it's been the last two decades forever. And in that whole area, China impacts that whole Pacific Rim as well, doesn't it? That's right. It's not just an important market for us directly, but it's a market for the products of lots of other countries as well, and therefore drives economic growth throughout the Asian subcontinent and, of course, here in, in North America and Europe as well. I, I guess it depends on your viewpoint. It looks like that low oil and gas prices is a good thing for the economy, and that is pretty significant. I really didn't. I bought gas for a dollar fifty-four this week. I didn't think I'd ever see that again. It is pretty amazing when you fill up your, your tank for what you can fill it up for today, compared to where we just were. It's a positive for much of U.S. agriculture. Obviously, it's a much you know, big reduction in production costs for a lot of producers, which is a fantastic thing. On the other hand, it has some you know, other implications as well. And when we talk about biofuels, for example, it becomes much more difficult to think about trying to use ethanol above the amount that we need for a 10% blend. 
because it's going to be very tough for ethanol to compete in that market at these kind of gasoline prices. I remember making an argument with a friend of mine that, that uh, we could never see corn prices really collapse because we were using so much for ethanol, and there's no way that we were ever going to have cheap gas. So I thought that was going to hold corn prices up. That has not worked out. Right. You think, again, think about the last couple of decades. You know, if you, what's caused the growth we've seen in U.S. agriculture on the crop side? It's largely been two things, China and biofuels. Biofuel growth, at least for now, appears to be at least slowed, if not stopped. And then China perhaps is slowing down as well. That's a bad combination on the demand side. So those those two th really important things have kind of collapsed. Right. Also, and, and they're related, but the value of our dollar is high, and so that really impacts our, our commodity prices as well because so much of it is exported. You bet, especially on the livestock side. We've seen that in spades this past year, where the, the much stronger value of the dollar has made our meat products, our dairy products, much more uh, challenged in, in international markets. And so we've seen a drop in our export sales. Uh, largely because of that factor. Well, let's let's take a look back, uh, specifically, I guess, to Missouri, but also the bigger picture in America. Uh, not necessarily a great year for farmers. It's been a very tough year. Uh, in 2013, we had record farm income in this country, just a couple years ago. Uh, but in 2015, the current USDA estimates are that we have roughly half the level of net farm income for the United States that we had just two years previously. You know, that's a phenomenal drop in just a very short period of time. Uh, it has caused lots of stress already out there in the countryside. So some people, because they had good years uh, uh, previously, may have built up some balances. Those can't last forever, however. So what caused that big drop? Uh, partly price, but also the yields weren't that great. Yields weren't as great in some parts of the country, but it was more price than anything else by far, both on crop and livestock side. Uh, we actually had record levels of you know, production in 2014 for crops, for example, uh, for the country as a whole. 2015, not far behind, it appears, based on current estimates. Uh, but prices have fallen so much off the previous peak set, uh, the value of those crops is down. Livestock side, we've increased production, a little bit weaker export sales has translated into much lower prices for beef, pork, and chicken. I know you're, you're responsible for really looking at things worldwide and nationwide, but what about Missouri specifically? And, and I guess that even varies by region in Missouri. Right, but yeah. Where are we at for this past year? You know, so Missouri, of course, you know, we had fantastic yields in 2014 for most of our crops in most of the state. So 2014 was a good production year in spite of the very sharp drop in prices. 2015, you know, of course, we had a lot of the state that couldn't even get a crop in the ground this year because of the extreme wet conditions in the spring. In other parts of the state, they didn't have such a fantastic yields they had a year ago. Throw in the fact that cattle prices, you know, feeder cattle prices have fallen off very sharply in recent months. It's not the same picture we had just a year or two ago. I think I remember that this summer about a million acres of soybeans went unplanted in Missouri. Is that, is that kind of where we're at? It's a little bit less than that, but yes, there was a significant amount of soybeans that did not get planted in the state this past year. Well, let's kind of go crop by crop maybe. Uh, I think uh, let's, let's look at corn first. That's a base for a lot of things, and it's a big crop in Missouri. Uh, where are we at on corn? I know there's a report out recently uh, showing maybe a, not quite as many uh, bushels, but still historically very high s stocks. Right. So this year's crop isn't quite as big as 2014 record crop that we harvest in the country, but it's still very big by historical standards. Throw in the fact that we had a lot of corn left over from the 2014 crop. You know, that combination means total supplies of corn are about as big as they were a year ago. Uh, so unless demand's a lot stronger than it currently appears likely to be, we're probably going to have large carry out come uh, harvest time this next fall. Uh, do you have any uh, good good news, things that could happen that would really change that dramatically? There's always weather you know, issues that can happen anywhere in the world. And if you want it to happen someplace else, you want somebody <laughs> else to have a problem so that you have more expert possibilities. So that's one possible positive thing that could happen. With lower livestock prices, uh, you know, we, we probably you know, will not see quite the growth in livestock that we might have wanted to see. Uh, there's always a chance that maybe export demand comes back at some point, and that'll be a little more positive thing longer term for feed, too. You, you mentioned uh, uh, the uh, ethanol issue. Uh, the whole uh, biofuel issue is somewhat political. I know even right. with the Iowa primaries, there's a debate going on between some of the candidates that are saying, let's do away with ethanol subsidies. Others are saying, no, we can't. That's a big part of the whole ethanol picture, which is a big part of the corn picture. Right. There's a, something called the Renewable Fuel Standard that requires a certain level of biofuel use in the nation's fuel supply. Uh, where that is said is always a controversial thing. EPA just recently came out with its proposed rule or its rule for, uh, for how that's supposed to work this, uh, this next year, next couple years in fact. Uh, and that's been criticized by a lot of people and there's even a lawsuit that appears to be happening uh, to, to maybe counter what's, what's been uh, done by EPA. What will happen in the future of course depends on not just uh, what happens in, in uh, the legal arena but also what happens in markets. If we have high oil prices it means one thing for the demand for gasoline and therefore the demand for ethanol and 10% blends but also makes it perhaps tougher to get more uh, 
uh, ethanol into uh, higher level blends. You say that the EPA uh, proposal has been criticized. I assume if it's a good proposal, it's criticized by both sides. That but, would be correct. Uh, what, what's the agriculture sector saying about it? Not enough of a requirement? Again, you have agriculture on both sides of this. You, know, you have a lot of crop producers who would like to see a much higher level of required uh, use. Uh, they'll point to what was passed in the 2007 Energy Act as uh, what they would see as, as requiring higher levels of use that have been proposed. Whereas some in the gasoline industry, obviously, but also in the, in the livestock industry, would rather have not as much of uh, the nation's grain supply go into making biofuels. So the, uh, there's people, even in agriculture, there's on both sides of the corn price debate. Some want it cheaper and some want it higher. There can be differences in that regard, <laughs> yes. Uh, let's talk about soybeans, a huge crop from Missouri. Um, so uh, wh where are we at with the soybean market? You've already talked about China. So China is obviously the big player on the demand side and the supply side. What happens in South America is always critically important. So we don't know for sure just how big the, you know, this year's soybean crop will prove to be in South America, but there's a good indication it's going to be another fairly good sized crop. Throw in the fact that we have a lot of soybeans left over from last year yet, and we probably have record level global supplies of soybeans. So unless demand is a lot stronger than it currently appears likely to be, we're going to have burdensome supplies of soybeans probably for some time to come, and it's tough to see soybean prices rising uh, to the kind of levels people would like to see. Uh, less of an issue for Missouri, wheat, uh, where are we at with wheat? And I'll, I'll follow that up with cotton. Sure. Wheat, uh, you know, prices have come back down pretty sharp, sharply now the last couple of years. Here in Missouri, we have problems, of course, with quality this past year. So even people who were able to harvest wheat may not have had the sort of quality with the fruits and get a decent price. But internationally, uh, wheat has now come back to have to be at, uh, compete with corn. There's so much corn in the world that wheat has to you know, have its price uh, consistent with the corn price anymore. In the case of cotton, uh, it's a, the, the problem again is China. Uh, China built up very large stocks of cotton a few years ago for policy reasons there. Uh, they've changed their policy now. They'd like to get rid of those stocks. <laughs> they have so many stocks they could keep the world price of cotton low for several years if they chose to do so. So um, get your crystal ball out. Uh, get some predictions here. I know you're, you guys are working on something which I'll ask you to explain, a, a baseline which you'll come out with that kind of gives uh, people a target for the next year. But can you give us a little preview of that and see where you think we'll be? Sure, and again, we may change our mind before we're done, but given what I know today, at least I'd probably tell you that we're looking for more of the same, frankly, for the next couple of years on the crop side. Uh, there's not a lot of things that are in my crystal ball, if you will, that would suggest that we're going to see a major recovery or a further decline in prices from where we're at today. Uh, there can always be a surprise in terms of increased production or whatever that can change that, but right now, not a big change. On the crop side, I probably expect to see a little bit more corn planted in 2016 than in 2015, but not a big increase. Soybeans may be about the same or a slight decrease. You know, it's, you, I've read this too from others that it looks like maybe a corn increase. From my viewpoint and my farm, it doesn't look like there's any profitable way <laughs> to grow corn for in the 360 range, right. which is about where we think we'll be. What's going to what's going to be the incentive to get more acres of any of our crops? Right, I don't think there is a lot of incentive right now to increase acreage. Uh, we do think you know if we have more normal weather in 2016, we may not have so much preventive planted acres as we had in 2015. So I could let a little bit come back in just because of that. Plus, we've had people push pretty hard on the soybean side the last two years because soybean prices have been very favorable compared to corn. So the maybe, more rotate back. maybe they rotate back to corn a little bit, but we're not talking about a big change. We're talking about a you know, relatively marginal change here for corn. In, in the past, when we've had these burdensome uh, crops overhead, something has been done. Back uh, in my day, talking about set-asides and so on, what's the, what's the government going to do here? Uh, you're talking about farm income being half of what it was two years ago. Well, that's a pretty significant. I, I read from Federal Reserve reports that there's a lot of concern in the country from banks. Is there any program here where the government would be able to step in and, and make some assistance? Sure. There are some policies in place already in the 2014 Farm Bill that do make payments when returns are low to producers. Mm -hmm. So for those who sign up for the Agricultural Risk Coverage Program, for example, on the crop side, they'll get payments if their county level revenues are lower than a trigger. So that will help at least some producers some places. But we're not talking about the kind of money it would take to get farm income back to anything like the levels we had in 2013. It does appear that unless there's a huge change in policy, that we're going to have a several couple of tough years in front of us here. It, it seems like to me that you've got, uh, in, in the past, we had mechanisms where Congress could step in. They made an effort in the last farm bill to put all these automatic things in place, but nothing uh, ad hoc. Uh, seems to be on the horizon, and, uh, and no kinds of disaster program stepping in, no kinds of emergency aid, none of that. Uh, that's that's going to put some real pressure on some farmsteads, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. I mean, we're seeing it already. That there are lots of farmers who are facing severe pressure already. Because they had relatively good years in many cases in 2011, 2012, 2013, they've got some, some, uh, you know, some cushion built up perhaps. Uh, but 2014 was tougher, 2015 even tougher it looks like. So eventually those reserves are going to be gone, uh, even for those who were prudent or lucky. Uh, so yes, we have some challenging times in front of us here. Uh, that's going to translate. Uh, we've had the highest land prices in history, and it seems to me like the highest relative to income that maybe that spread that we've ever had. Are you seeing any downward pressure on land and rent? We are seeing some in some parts of the country, uh, particularly the places where maybe we saw prices go higher than there was any good justification for. Uh, so some parts of the country have seen adjustments already. Here in Missouri, maybe not quite as much, but I argue here in Missouri, we probably didn't have prices reach the kind of levels they saw elsewhere. Well, I, some prime farmland in Iowa and Illinois that was in the, the like, Eighteen, twenty thousand right. dollars an acre. That seems that seems insane to me, but yes. uh, uh, that well, makes it a long ways to fall when it does start to fall. Yeah, the combination of lower returns to crop production and potentially higher interest rates as well is a very bad combination when it comes to the value of land. Really, really would have an impact. All right, we've talked about the uh, the crop sector. Let's talk a little bit about the livestock sector. Uh, most of the hogs are in pretty big hands now, uh, mostly corporate or very large family operations. But where are we at on the hog business? We had you know, very good hog prices in 2014, uh, not because of uh, great planning, but because we had a disease problem that really mm -hmm. reduced our pork production in 2014. So for those who had pork to, hogs to sell, it was a very good year. 2015, because the, the disease problems were not nearly as severe and because people responded to the good returns, of 2014 we greatly expanded production in 2015. And what was a profitable year in 2014 is no longer profitable at this point. Uh, the cattle sector, um, in my operation, I've got some cows. It was really good through about August, and it started to fall. It fell farther and faster than I imagined. And in Missouri, we're a big cow-calf state. That is a huge impact. You bet. Uh, the number one you know, livestock industry in this state is going to be the, the cow-calf producer. And yes, we had some phenomenal prices for, for feeder seeds just a couple years ago, as recently as a few months ago, frankly. But now the last few months, we've dropped really, really hard on those markets. Uh, it was probably going to happen sooner or later, but the fact that it happened so fast and so hard was a bit of a surprise. I know there's, there's actually a group, I think, out west that's calling for a congressional investigation to why it fell so far and so fast. My guess is the, the market forces <laughs> drove it down. Can you describe a little bit about what happened to make sure. it hap happen so far and so fast? You know, a lot of things came together at once. I mean, yes, we had some supplies start to come back onto the market. We also have reduced export sales for some of the reasons we talked about already, and just a lot of competition out there. Uh, we have increased pork, increased chicken production this year. The total amount of meat that's actually uh, being supplied to the U.S. market is up pretty substantially from a year ago. Uh, per capita consumption of meat in this country dropped pretty sharply from 2007 to 2012, held about constant for a couple of years. Now in 2015, we actually increased per capita consumption by a fair amount, and that's tough to do unless prices go down. So part of that is burdensome supplies lead to yeah. higher per capita construct. Right. As I understand it, there's, there's a couple of things. We were really dependent on the export market, which you alluded to earlier. Uh, how important is the export market to our beef market? It's very important. I mean, we, especially a lot of our higher value uh, exports are a very important part of the overall revenue picture on the cattle side. Well, we quite often import a, a larger quantity of beef than we export. In terms of values, we're almost always a significant net beef exporter. We're e exporting the uh, higher end cuts, Typically importing is. some of the lower yeah. uh, cuts for hamburger and right. lower quality meats. Right. Uh, so it seems like to me in the past that if we had cheaper grain, we had higher cattle. That did not work out. In fact, the, the market seemed to follow each other. Yeah, uh, but, I, but I argue there's, there's a lags, obviously. You know, there's this thing called biology. So it takes a long time <laughs> to the time a calf is born to the time it's ready for market. Okay. Throw in some drought conditions in, in, in the Plain States. You know, it took a lot longer for us to rebuild beef production than normally would have taken. So you know, as we uh, saw the drop in in, uh, in feed prices, provided the further incentive, and so now we've seen this big increase in production. In Missouri, we, we're not a big uh, feeder, uh, uh, fed cattle state, and we're not a big feedlots, and no no packers, to, okay. no significant packers. That was also a big part of the the collapse, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, it's true. That's only true. Uh, we had a situation where there was more beef in the country than we really. Uh, or excuse me, more packing ability in this country than we had beef to supply for a long time. So there wasn't any incentive to expand packing capacity uh, for several years there now. 
we'll see as beef production increases again whether uh, that change that may change a bit. And as I understand it, this fall we had the highest slaughter weights in uh, uh, history too, right. uh, big big carcasses because people were feeding right. longer and so on. Right. So we'll see if the lower prices may may change that a bit now. Well, again, we're looking for uh, maybe a better improvement in the future as we work uh, through some of this burdensome supply. Do you think there's any chance that those markets will, will come back and be a little stronger? I think uh, the demand picture is going to be very important here. I mean, can we regain some of the export markets that we have lost this past year? Will the dollar stay as strong as it's been in recent months? You know, those kind of factors will be very important on the demand side. On supply side, you know, I think beef is going to be what it's going to be right now, uh, given the things that are already in motion. But pork and chicken can adapt a little bit more quickly to the circumstances. Maybe we'll see a slower growth on that side that'll help us build the beef as well. And, and that's an interesting part of the beef uh, equation. Uh, it's a that's the longest term, but the yeah. time you breed a a cow and have a calf and get it to market is a two or ten and a half year process. Are we seeing heifer retention? Are we seeing a build up of the herd? Because for a while we had a very low herd. I think if I remember right, maybe the lowest herd since the 50s. Where are we at on that process? Yeah, we are seeing beef cow herds come back. So we are actually increasing the size of the beef herd nationally at a pretty significant pace, actually. So we are on pace to produce more beef in the, in the year ahead. Let's come back just a minute to farm programs. I know that's what you guys, uh, uh, you advise the Congress on what they can do. There's a farm program in place, and you, you mentioned it earlier, uh, uh, a couple of different programs. They seem very complicated to me, and yet, can you make any predictions for us as to what might happen this year in terms of direct government assistance? Sure, they are very complicated programs. One I mentioned before, it's called Agricultural Risk Coverage, ARC for short. So under the ARC program, people get payments if the revenue in their county for a given crop price times yield is less than a trigger amount set by past levels of things. Uh, whether a given county gets a payment here depends on lots of these complicated factors. So last year in Missouri, for example, for the 2014 crop, almost no payments were made uh, uh, for ARC under the corn or soybean programs. For 2015, we'll see. It's going to depend exactly where yields prove to be at the end of the day, what our final prices are for the year. So some counties may get payments, other counties may not. Uh, that's the nature of the program. It's supposed to be t tailored to local conditions. For those who chose the other option, price loss coverage, that's based strictly on price. So if the price drops below trigger, a payment occurs. Those price triggers for corn are 370 a bushel. Right now it appears we, we could very well end up with a price below that level. So the Joe's PLC may get a payment for, for corn this year. Last year, producers in Minnesota, I think, got the most, if okay. I read right, but uh, only a handful of counties in Missouri. Uh, is there, do you have any, I know it's way too early, so I'm really putting you on the spot. Any predictions that we might get a payment when it would, when it would happen? Sure, I do think there'll be some counties that probably will get a payment for this year. It won't be every county. And there'll be big variation among the counties this year, it appears right now, for corn and maybe even for soybeans uh, this current year. If a payment occurs, it will occur in October of 2016. So we're still several months so away be, from those payments. So looking out a ways before, uh, right. before that help is there. Right. So how do you see the overall picture of the economy? Again, asking you to use your crystal ball. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, in the world. And, and where do you see our economy uh, going over the next few years? The overall economy has is, is been stronger than it was. That's a positive sign. Uh, but on the other hand, there's lots of storm clouds out there as well. Uh, there's always a possibility of, of war or some other thing that could disrupt everything in the world. But also you have the issue just of this, this recovery, while not horribly strong, is long lived now. This has been the average length of a recovery. So at some point we could have another recession and what will be the toolbox that policymakers can go to to try to deal with a recession? If monetary policy is tough to do much on, and if it's difficult to get agreement in Washington on fiscal policy? I know uh, one of the things that you folks work on is helping ag groups and, and Congress try to, to uh, get a handle on what regulatory impacts uh, might be on individual farms. Can you tell us a little bit, or is there anything out there that is a little scary or is gonna have an impact on farmers' income and ability to produce? There's definitely lots of regulations that, that matter to the farm sector every day of the week. Uh, so you know, uh, what happens in biofuel policy we talked about already could be very important. There's the Waters the United States rules that's commonly known, uh, the Clean Water Rule more formally, uh, that could potentially bring a lot of uh, Missouri farmland under, under uh, uh, a jurisdiction and require uh, folks to have plans to, to deal with runoff from those farms. People have been very concerned about that. What they'll mean in practice if they ever get to that stage, we don't know yet because we don't know for sure how things will be implemented ultimately. Uh, but there's also just lots of other day-to-day -day regulations. When we have a new uh, uh, we have the election coming up this fall, 
you know, that could change who, who's making those choices, of course, as well. Uh, I think every election is important. This seems like a, a watershed election in terms of where, what direction the country is going to go. It, it, you see any major differences in what the the presidential candidates are saying now that would be a dramatic change in, in direction for U.S. agriculture. I mean, as we talk right now, there's lots of presidential candidates, so trying to guess who might be where <laughs> is a tough thing right now. But it's certainly true that the parties have differences about what they want to see in the economy as a whole in agriculture, perhaps in particular. Uh, a couple of things that I think could be very important uh, in agriculture would be tax policy in the future where the parties have their own, you know, their different, very different points of view on some of those issues, and just the issues of subsidies in general. Uh, you could imagine if there were, for example, if there was a Republican Congress and a Republican president, we could have a, a significant budget cutting effort in 2017 that could affect uh, agricultural subsidies as well as everything else. And, and yet some of those uh, agricultural congressmen are uh, from farm states. It seems like the Congress is a much different Congress than it used to be in terms of how they look at things. Uh, do you get good cooperation and people listening to and caring about agricultural issues when you go to the Hill? I think there's still a lot of people who do care about it very much so. Uh, but, the, but it's certainly true that agriculture is a smaller share of the, the Congress now than it once was. Far fewer uh, congressmen in particular uh, from districts that have lots of agriculture in them. So fewer members of Congress have a direct interest in agricultural issues. Well, I want to thank you for coming. I know you're very busy and really, really appreciate it. But thanks to Mr. Westhoff for being with us tonight and sharing his insights. That's all the time we have for tonight. But before we go, we'd like also, also like to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to Show Me Egg. Be sure to attend in next time for another look at a topic touching rural Missouri. For everyone here at CAMOS and myself, good night. We're also very interested in what you have to say. So if you have feedback you'd like to share with us, you can email us at showmeegg at camos.org or find us on Facebook.